Good afternoon. Welcome to the headquarters of the Lowy Institute at 31 Bly Street for this special address by the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, the Honourable James Marape. I'm Michael Fullilove, the Executive Director of the Institute. First, let me acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which the Institute stands, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Ladies and gentlemen, Papua New Guinea and Australia are the oldest of friends. The connections between our two countries go back thousands of years with trade in pearls and turtle shells across the Torres Strait. Every Australian schoolchild grows up hearing about the brave men who carried wounded diggers to safety during the brutal fighting along the Kokoda track. Last Thursday, Prime Ministers Marape and Albanese signed a new bilateral security agreement that provides for greater cooperation on policing, cybersecurity and development. So the relationship is, is improving and getting closer. And a close relationship starts with mutual understanding and mutual understanding starts with listening to one another. In that spirit, it's a pleasure to welcome the Prime Minister here today for his second address to the Institute. James Marape has served as the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea since May 2019. Indeed, when the PM first spoke to the Institute of July of that year, it was his first overseas address as Prime Minister. Mr Marape has been a Member of Parliament since 2007 and has served in a number of key Cabinet positions, including as Foreign Minister, Minister of Finance and Minister of Education. After the Prime Minister delivers his remarks, he'll join me on convers in for a conversation on the stage. Prime Minister Marape, let me now invite you to address the Lowy Institute. Welcome, sir. All right, let me thank uh, Dr. Michael. Thank you very much for the uh, cordial and warm welcome and the hospitality uh, Lowy Institute once again uh, has conferred to me and my delegation. Uh, we're happy to once again find ourselves in the company of many of you who are profound and deep thinkers, uh, and especially within the rich and precinct of uh, this uh, wonderful institution. Uh, let me continue to uh, thank uh, Lowy for being a uh, public policy uh, you and, and then uh, you know you spin the public conversations and public policies, uh, both not just in uh, Australia but also across the uh, Torres Strait into PNG, the Greater Pacific. And I am happy to be once again back here. Uh, joining you, Michael. Let me acknowledge the uh, the indigenous and First Nation people on whose land we are here today. We do pay the respects to the elders of past and uh, today, as well as uh, the emerging and those who will continue uh, on after. I want to also pay my respect to greater Australia people. Uh, thank you for your continued uh, support to our country, uh, Papua New Guinea, in case the younger generation Australians do not know. Uh, before 1975, we carried the same passport. Uh, before 1975, we belonged to the same sovereignty. Uh, it was in 1975 that we decided to be two uh, nations, uh, brother and sister nations. It's only 48 years ago uh, since then, going 49th uh, year coming up next year. And so it is important for us to maintain rapport, have exchanges, not just at government to government level, but more importantly at uh, public service to public service. Uh, our, uh, educational institutions to educational institutions, our business and private sector, uh, and Australian business and private sector, but more importantly, our people to people. And I am happy once again to represent my country and the uh, possibly 12 million plus people of Papua New Guinea to once again present here in Lowy uh, on the margins of my main streets this morning earlier when I addressed the mining and resource sector conference uh, that is still going on at Sydney Con uh, Con Business Centre or Con Sydney Conference Centre uh, today. Papua New Guinea is still emerging as I sp as I speak. The last time I was here in 25th of July 2019, my conversation was that we are now writing a new book. We are closing the part of our nation's history, especially 
a history that is attached with complacency and corruption. And we're moving into a new phase in our nation's life. And so, in as far as the new book is concerned, I've lived through the 45th anniversary of our country's independence that coincided with COVID-19. Uh, coming out of COVID-19 in the 46th anniversary, and we lived through the 47th anniversary, and this year we've celebrated our 48th anniversary as a sovereign nation. Our nation has emerged through many challenges of past. Just to give you all some retrospective hindsight, uh, in 1975, when we parted ways as uh, sovereignty, uh, when Australia granted us independence, our economy was sized under 5 billion kina. So that is your reference point for those of you who are in the know-how. We were a 5 billion kina economy. And if you think that is much, you extrapolate that, uh, Dr. Michael, against a nation that is sized at 462,840 square kilometers of land. You have swamps, you have mountains, you have islands. In there you had about 3.5 million people. If you do that, then as, as economists and social planners, you would know an economy that is sized at 5 billion kina with that mountain of obstacle, the big landmass, big population, uh, that was our starting point. And if you throw in into the fray the continuous changes of government we had from 1975 up till uh, 2002, the economy at 5 billion kina in 1975 uh, progressed to an economy of 17 billion kina in 2002. So for 27 years, we only shifted the pendulum on the economic growth by just about 12 billion kina. 12 billion kina. At the same time, population was growing much faster. And for those of you economists, I'm not an economist, but uh, you know the basic, basic formula of success in an economy. Population growth must be below economic growth. Economic growth must be north, and population growth must be south on, in as far as the uh, formula is concerned. Historically, our economic growth has been below 3%, and our population growth has been above 3%. Simply put, that was unsustainable. Exacerbated by continuous change of government, and the instability that exists or that permeated the entire structure of government from 1975 to 2002. If you, if you want me to run through how PNZ came in the first 27 years, we had general elections in 1977, after Gulf Whitlam were able to give us self-government on December 1st, 1973, 75, September 16, we became independent. 77 first general elections, 1980 first successful vote of no confidence, 1982 general elections, 1985 vote of no confidence, a successful change of government, 1987 general elections, 1988 successful vote of no confidence, 1992 general elections, 1995 successful vote of no confidence, 1997 sandline crisis, and an acting prime minister, 1997 general elections, then 1999 successful vote of no confidence when Mekere came in, and then 2002. Apart from Bougainville crisis that started when we were only 14 years as a nation in 1988, and that ran for 10 years in the same timeline. So the first 27 years of our life, uh, Dr. Michael, we were busy playing politics, the shifting sand of our public service that was non-responsive to a stable government and the economic productivity that was quite weak. Our reliance on one or two mineral sector uh, was closed when Pangona mine closed. Our non-focus in the diversification of our economy, especially uh, building down on agriculture that used to be traditionally a strong PNG economic base in the 70s. Uh, that is the backdrop in which we have emerged. Uh, 2002, uh, if you put that as a reference pointer, at a 17 billion Kenya economy, uh, lucky at the backdrop of political stability, the Somalia government had nine full years of being in office. And that started, that stability gave a focal point in which government was out engaged with investors. And at the backdrop of 2008 and 
2009 or 2007 and 8 rather global financial crisis, we were able to engage ExxonMobil in the PNG LNG project. And that PNG LNG project, if you ask me what became the uh, impetus for the next wave of economic growth, that was a stimulant, that was the impetus, that was the growth basis. And from a 17 billion Kenya economy in 2002, by 2011, when Somalia government exceeded, he exceeded with a 44 billion Kenya economy, and I'm being, using average figures here. And by 2019, when I took office, it was a 79 billion Kenya economy. But the, the worst news was population was still growing, uncatailed, unmanaged. 70, 80% of the population were half educated, unengaged, semi-skilled. And so that was, those were the backdrop and the problems we were faced with in 2019 when we took office. I just want to encourage everyone that uh, apart from all this sort of bad outlook, the greater structure of our society remained uh, consistent. Our democracy remained vibrant. Our economy uh, and the fundamentals had every indication of positivity. And so we had to just tap into the, the uh, positive characters of our country and our economy. The number one good character we have is uh, resilient people. Our people intrinsically are friendly, culturally, they are hospitable, welcoming, they're Christians. And in the midst of our diversity, we find our common ground in things like rugby league and, and uh, the good side of life. The good people combined with the independent functionality of our judiciary remain a big cornerstone of our economy. So judiciary remained very independent. Our politics is robustly democratic. Government come and government can go, but the main fixture of how our democracy prevails is maintained. Never at one time have our country fallen to the rule of gun or rule of one big man. We continue to have, even those transitions were taking place, they were taking place within the shade of democratic provisions of our country's constitution. So the big upside pluses of our, uh, our national character remain fixed, preservation of our democracy, a vibrant free market economy, and a society that was deeply Christian and Melanesian, tolerant to uh, the difference of opinion and worldviews. So we remain fixed. When I arrived in 2019, I came here. Uh, if you forget about everything else that I speak, I know, uh, Lowy, you have a good uh, 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 registry of all speeches uh, spoken here, so you can easily pick from your file. If you pick from your file, you would have heard from what we wanted to do as a government. And you go through them, and you, you have it on record. Just go through them and see whether we've ticked off ICAC. See whether we're structuring better deal from our projects that I've committed to uh, negotiate. See whether we're having a foreign policy outlook that relates to all without compromising our core values and our core principles and our core relationships. In my address here at Lowy on the 25th of July, 2019, I just said exactly what we will step out to do. Today, as I speak on, ICAC has been established. Remember the first time ICAC was mooted in my country was in the mid 80s. Seven prime ministers before me never delivered ICAC. I almost lost government at the back of passing the ICAC bill in 2020, when right after passing ICAC, one third of my cabinet and fellow politicians decided to move on the other side. But by God's grace, government was restored and we're still here. ICAC's delivered. Our focus to ensure that 80% of the public services in rural PNG and 20% is in the central government is a restructure that is going on. Our focus to increase public service efficiency has been worked upon. Few key people are appointed based on merit, just to name one or two. Uh, for instance, a non tax man, but a strong ethical lawyer, but now Sam Coim was brought from outside, placed in our internal revenue. Today, four years on, he's collecting double the size of uh, tax collection with no increase to tax except we've reduced tax. For those who earn under 20,000, they don't pay uh, tax anymore in terms of personal income tax. With no additional increase on tax, we have increased collection twice the size on what we were collecting before 2019. So we, I committed to increasing efficiency. It is still a burden, a long way to go, but we've started the journey and uh, some life changing that is shown in our public service. And I sit here with my chief secretary. He's a, 
uh, testament to someone brought from outside to come into the public service also. We also looked at ensuring that our budget is structured and to carry the economy in tough times. We structured budget, although we had strong deficit around the time we took over as a government. Uh, most of you know in 2019, I inherited an economy was in decline. And I speak as former finance minister, knew exactly what the state of economy in 2018 and 19 was. We were on record 2018, 3% growth rate. Uh, we took over that economy in 2019. We restructured, but we sailed straight into COVID-19. That saw us increasing our deficit by 8 to 9% in 2020, so that we keep our heads above waters. Who else didn't? Australia did. All economies did. All countries did. They restructured their budgets as a result of COVID-19 shutdown. We did, but as soon as we hit the highest deficit in 2020, we won a fiscal consolidation to come back to balanced budget at the very earliest. We hope to hit balanced budget by 2027. And my trust rate is quite aggressive. I am not aggressive, but we're inclined to move towards eliminating or bringing down our, our debt to a sustainable level in the time we hit the 2030s. And that's a work in progress for us. So we knew we had to use our budget to ensure we have sufficient liquidity in the economy. The last four budgets we've delivered over 101 billion kina spending from 2019 supplementary right till 2023 supplementary. That is what we did. We're using a budget to ensure we try our very best to spread the love in as far as government care to all sectors and all part of our country. Our flexible Connect PNG program tries to unravel our economic potentials in all part of our country. When Australia granted us independence in 1975, there were only two or three highways that was possible. Uh, we're working to open up that 462,840 square kilometers of land with key enabling infrastructures. Thankfully, Australia government's still with us. They're supporting us with uh, budget support, as well as soft concession landings to key infrastructures, ports, and, uh, and uh, roads, to name two important ones. I want to also indicate that we're working to reconstruct our foreign relationships without compromising our own key values. We relate to all at no compromise to our values and who is who in the space of the individual pathways in our bilateral relationship with concern. And we also have other potentials that has not been harnessed before. Example, the green economy space. Today, when I addressed the Mining and Petroleum Conference, I said everyone is welcome to operate in Papua New Guinea. We're still a green economy. And someone may ask, what do I mean by this? It's a simple reflection that our economy has, our country rather, has a greater propensity for carbon sink than what we are producing right now. Someone asked me at the conference and someone also asked me in, in, uh, in Dubai at the margins of COP28, what is your commitment to, uh, to the climate change? And I said, Papua New Guinea is uh, carbon negative, not carbon neutral. We are a carbon negative country. Our carbon sink propensity is over 100 million metric tons. Current emittents from Papua New Guinea industry, Papua New Guinea people is around 10 million metric tons. So all who operate in the economy will have a green identity, green label, that they are operating in a green country. And this is something that we are trying to promote in a big way. Some of you would have seen my work with President Macron on the, uh, the step up on our forestry conservation, forestry protection, our forestation program, and sustainable use of our forest resources so that we maintain our green labeling as a country going forward in a world that is conscious of the climate change effect and the mitigations that is running all over the place. Those have been work we've been trying to do just pick a copy of my speech in, uh, in 2019, and I want you all to give me an assessment, an honest assessment. I will not tell you and go through all the list of everything we have done, but some of the major focus of what we want to do, we have started. My conversation on getting back better for our natural resources. Someone thought I would be chasing our investors, but in the same four years, we attracted Nimod, for instance, the biggest gold mining company in the world, came into PNG. Nimod. Australia's own Telstra, the number one company, came into PNG. We were able to successfully conclude the Santos takeover of oil sets in PNG. 
we were able to allow for PNG government and Barik, the second biggest gold company, to renegotiate better terms from a zero equity ownership by national government. Now national government has 36% equity in the new POGRA. Our landowners have 15% equity in the new POGRA. And the total re ownership structure of the new POGRA is 51% in favor of Papua New Guinea beneficiaries, 49% to our investors. Uh, they've read me clearly. I tell them, you don't lose any, uh, you don't lose, uh, lose a return on investment. You invest on your side, you make a return on investment, we return on, invest on our side, uh, you go home winning and we go home winning. Your rate of return on investment will be benchmark against your investments in PA economies and your investment uh, and return on, return on investment scales that you are used to in some of your global operations. And so the POGRA benchmark is something that is consistent with our tech back PNG philosophy. Without harming investors, you win, we win. But we win on the upside simply on the basis that safety and better work environment is government's business. The better we earn, the more we plow back to law and order and to enabling infrastructures, et cetera, et cetera. So we've come close to, uh, close to uh, be on, on the path in which I envisage uh, in May 30th, 2019, when I made my first maiden statement. Uh, and not all is achieved yet as I speak. Uh, some big weaknesses that continue to uh, haunt us is the uh, massiveness of a public service. Sometimes it's ineffective and uh, inefficient. The lawlessness that remains and permeates in our society. The political instability in all structure of, of our country and uh, continued exposure to uh, imported inflation and global economy uh, shocks that happen as a result of a war elsewhere or uh, uh, increased oil price elsewhere, and also our, our own uh, sometimes feeble economic fundamentals we have in our country. Those weaknesses still remain. But on the upside, Papua New remains closer to the market for all our producers. We are much, much closer than uh, far off. Uh, most of the nations that I've related to are big buyers of our producers. For instance, the People's Republic of China buys over 50% of our total produce. I, I gather that uh, they buy 30% of Australia's total produce, so we're in good company in that space. Uh, and so uh, the market reach for Papua New Guinea remains very much closer to home than far away. Japan, the third biggest economy within our reach, South Korea within our reach, Indonesia within our reach. India has come on board lately. I'm working in the Indian space to ensure we have a readily available supplement or complementary market for our produce in, in, in case some of our market elsewhere uh, it's not, uh, it's, it's, uh, we have a problem elsewhere. India has stepped up big as an alternate market for our produce. And of course, we're encouraging USA and Australia. We're not just security conscious. As we discuss security, bring your investments, in, investments into Papua New Guinea, especially investments as we focus on a downstream process, diversified economy. We're looking forward to a time in the next 10 years, uh, Dr. Michael, that we make transition from uh, export of raw produce to uh, export of finished produce from our own resources, whether it's in gold, copper, or minerals, or in the uh, renewable resources like agricultural produces, forestry produce, and fishery produce. So those are the directions we are shifting, focusing very much on diversifying economy and moving at the very earliest. We want to go into downstream processing, and our government has put in programs in place in state equity funding available, state land accessibility available, as well as putting money for SME support that has been continuously run in our effort to diversify and strengthen the economy. Now, why do I speak on the economy? I do not want forever to be a borrower. I do not want forever to be a recipient of aid and grant. Papua New Guinea has emerged as shared leaders in the Pacific. We want to share responsibility with Australia to assist in keeping our Pacific safe and keeping our brothers and sisters in the greater Pacific also being assisted. We had in the latest Pacific Games our own contribution with Australia. We assisted Solomon Islands. In the last PIF, we were able to retire some commitments of past governments. We gave some little money to Cook Island, to Tonga for the disaster, and to, uh, to also uh, one or two other nations. That is our shared responsibility with Australia 
to ensure Pacific remains free, Pacific remains a fair place, and we keep our pristine and lifestyle uh, for not just ourselves, but more importantly, our children to come after. And so I want to uh, say to each and every one of you here at Lowy, thank you for, for uh, giving us an opportunity. You have to look into our statistics. If in the first 44 years, the seven predecessors before me worked to grow our economy from a, at the macro economy speaking, from a 5 billion Kenya economy to a 79 billion Kenya economy. It's not James Marape speaking, but World Bank, IMF, everyone says that by next year, this time, we'll be 120 billion Kenya economy. And that's a 50% double down in just four years, and five years. That's at the macro scale. In the next 10 years, I'll be lining six projects. They're all in uh, almost mature states. Pogra is restarting. We've retired all statutory obligations. Pogra is restarting, and Barrick, as our operator, will be announcing uh, the time in which it will be restarting uh, this afternoon, if not tomorrow. Wafi Golpu project is a couple of process away. We have delivered what is called a mine development contract and SML back to back for Pogra. I have here with me the Vice Minister, the Honorable uh, Jimmy Maladina, who assists me in the state negotiations. We are uh, MDC and SML away from Wafi Golfo project, which is a five to six billion dollar uh, investment project. We've already sequenced Papua LNG FID final investment decision with Pinang LNG FID back to back. There'll be about five, six, seven years of construction, both Papua and Pinang. ExxonMobil tells me there's a bigger uh, gas find. They're, they're drilling the lo deepest drill in what is called the Eastern Papua and Fall Belt. If those of you know uh, the map of Papua New Guinea, if you know Karama Town, a little bit north, north, northwest of Karama Town, they'll be sp spotting five kilometers of well into hitting what is called Toro or sand basins below. Uh, that's a, uh, I'm not a geologist, but they say it's something in that, in that, uh, something that goes like that. To establish whether it's a 30 TCF or a 13, 15 TCF or a 1 TCF of gas. The seismic reveals some fine in that space. Now, if that is established, we will be sequencing oil and gas for the next 10 to 15 years in terms of construction. PNG will be a gas producing nation for the next 40 years to 50 years. And we bring our oil and uh, our, our gold and copper projects into the picture. We have about five, six exciting projects. Never before in our country's history, you have simultaneous projects running in 10 years in a row. The next 10 years will be projects after projects after projects. That should see me hit by 2029, my focus of a 200 billion Kenya economy by 2029. And our country should be on its way to be a growth economy in the 2030s. I look forward to your continuous, uh, continuous uh, assessment in how we're doing business up there. I'm not here to buy your support. I value constructive criticisms especially when uh, criticisms come with alternates to point us in the right road. Uh, no one is all-knowing. Uh, any help from any Australian institutions is welcomed, especially from Lowy with a ton of credibility behind you and your heap of experience. Uh, everything we say and do in your fair assessment, if you feel something else needs to be done, we look forward to a considered recommendation from yourself. But I just want to conclude, in tough times, we have studied the SIP. We have structured our public service. Uh, to, we have put up corruption-fighting institutions. The assistant Australia government is giving us lately is to come into the space of making sure we have more judges, training more police, infusing uh, police, especially into mid-management level, with the independence to ensure we prosecute cases that are outstanding for some time. Uh, this all work in progress to improve the law and order space. I see work in the law and order space from an economic spectrum. For there is no point increasing the size of the economy if the economy is to be ransacked by lawlessness, including white collar crimes. And so we work in that space to protect the gains from the economy. And Australia is partnering us lately now in a big way in the law and, law and order space and in the internal security. I'm working with USA in the external security. Two difference. Internal security, uh, we're working with Australia. And uh, external security, we're working with USA. And Australians here, taxpayers, don't feel that your taxpaying money is wasted. 
you have over 5,000 Australian companies uh, who do business in Papua New Guinea. But more than this, uh, you know, you might have canoes coming down seeking refuge in, in, in Australia if PNG is a failed state. And so we're working to ensure PNG is not a failed state. Uh, we are a proud nation. We are resilient people. We have our own ups and downs. But uh, please, journey with me. I may not be Prime Minister 10 years from today, but the, but the path we've outlaid is a path to economic independence, economic self-reliance, a prosperous nation. And at the end of the road, we stand to assist Australia carry the load in our part of the world as we live together to face an Asian century that faces us. Thank you very much. God bless. PM, thank you for that interesting and important speech. Um, thank you for the nice things you said about the Lowy Institute. And I must say I'm proud of my Pacific team, Meg Keane, Mihai Sora, Maho Lavale, um, Jess Collins and others. And you're right, we're up in, uh, up in PNG a lot. We love getting up there. I love getting up there. Um, and it's wonderful to hear a speech about uh, Papua New Guinean self-reliance, prosperity, security, um, and, sh and burden sharing. So thank you very much. Thank you for referencing your 2019 speech repeatedly. We love it when guests refer to our back catalogue at the Institute, and we'll make sure that the 2019 speech is available on the website so that you all can take up the PM's invitation to mark his progress against it. Um, let me ask you one question about that. You, you referred to some of the, the things that you promised in 2019 and you ticked them off. What's the biggest disappointment when you look back at that speech in 2019, when you look back at the, the, the hopes that you had when you became Prime Minister? What's the biggest, the single biggest piece of unfinished business for you, do you think? I guess it's not unfinished business, but it's a slow turnaround time from the public service. Mm. No one catches the big picture, they all engage in the small, small picture. Yeah. yeah, and that's where political leadership is required to get people right. to raise their eyes. The difference between Australia and PNG is that Australia has a, has a functional public service that is fixed, so you can change in between, but the work carries on. In yeah. PNG, it's the converse. If you have a boss watching down, work gets done. If the boss is not watching, everyone's caught up in the small picture. All right. Let me – I'm in the – I'm going to go to the audience in a minute and give them an opportunity to ask you some questions. But I want to uh, – you, you spoke a lot about um, PNG's national development since you became PM. You hinted uh, towards the end in particular about some of PNG's international relations, but I I'd like to take you there with your permission and, and ask you a little bit more about those elements. Uh, first of all, you referred to the, the security pact that you signed on Thursday with Prime Minister Albanese. Um, the way you're, you're thinking about it, you just said, is you're working with Australia more on internal security, more with the United States on, on external security. Tell us a bit more about your hopes for this treaty. Why is it, why, or for this agreement, why is it in PNG's interests? Well, we, we have a shared interest, put it this way. You have uh, uh, more Australian companies investing in PNG than anywhere else. Uh, uh, if you look at the density of Australian investments else outside of Australia. So it is in our shared interest. And uh, we have ramped up our own allocations to the law and justice sector in a big way. Uh, we now, at the minimum, allocating at around 10%, just purely to the law and justice sector, whether it's the judiciary. Uh, our, believe it or not, our maestral services were get, getting small allocations, below 10 million before we took office. Now we've gone past 100 million allocations to the maestral services. They deal with almost 80% of the summary offenses, the everyday common uh, 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 criminal offenses, uh, so to speak. So our allocation to judiciary has stepped up. And if I go down this path in allocating to the lower justice sector, uh, speaking as a planner for my country, it will take me 10 to 15 years to get there to a fully functional law and justice sector system. Now, with the partnership with Australia, it, it cuts back that 15 year, 10 to 15 year to possibly a five year, six year sort of space. So I'm wrapping up on my intervention, including putting additional uh, judges into, into uh, our Supreme Court and National Court judges, uh, the bench. We've uh, amended the law to increase the judge threshold to 200 judges. The current 40 judges carry a huge backlog. Some cases go 
back as far as uh, 10 years. So having more judges, more co- uh, I almost used the word competent, but uh, anyway, so more judges on the bench in the different space of competence in a modern economy. It's no longer just one aspect of reading law. And for me, especially speaking from an economic perspective, we need also judges to read commercial laws and international laws. We now have four of the biggest uh, international companies in PNG. Uh, Total, ExxonMobil, too big in oil and gas. Uh, Barrick and, and, uh, and uh, Newmont, the too big in, in gold and copper. And so it is already a, a, a economy with international uh, big firms. Uh, we need good judges, uh, readers of laws. And we're passing a law for arbitrations. We want to also have arbitration in, in our own uh, jurisdiction instead of having arbitrations out in Singapore elsewhere. So uh, we're shaping up a modern economy, but a modern economy is totally redundant. If law reading, law enforcement, court case management uh, doesn't work. So in my interest, instead of government waiting to invest 15 years to ramp that sector, we want to bridge the gap down to five to six years so that I get the law and order sorted out in this decade than waiting to do it in the 2030s. All right, let me ask you about the the agreement with the United States, which is more about international security, the Defence Cooperation Agreement or the DCA. I know the DCA was quite controversial in some parts of the PNG community. Why did you think it was important to sign it? How do you see the United States as a strategic actor in the region? Why do you think it's important to keep Washington engaged in the Pacific? Well, same, same. The US has always been around in our part of the world. They are a mother of democracies. They are the biggest free market in terms of economy. So most of the intrinsic character of PNG, whether it's the economic character or, or public service or government structure, is similar with USA. So some of these core values, you, you have to align with those who, are, who have so a common value to yourself. And uh, they haven't come in at their own uh, sort of, they haven't budgeted into, into PNG. We work with them. We work with them in that space. We, and so, again, with the security agreement with Australia and the defense cooperation with USA, uh, it's not in their doing, but at our invitation. Mm-hmm. Similar to the internal security, there was a need for us to ensure that we protect our sovereignty. We have illegal theft of fish going in our high waters all the time. Since this year, we have caught 30 illegal fishing boats. PNG Navy gets on the US Navy ship, get out there, and we police the water, satellite imaging. Mm. That accessibility is something we've never had before. Mm. So US and our partnership comes in the territorial defense. Uh, and uh, mind you, we're not a small island state. We're a big island state. Mm. Uh, our country is bigger than Japan in terms of landmass. Our country is bigger than New in terms of landmass. Mm. Our country is bigger than UK in terms of landmass. So we are a big island state. We've got more islands in PNG than all the other Pacific Island nations put mm. together. 600 islands. Mm. So I need to defend my sovereignty. And so it is in that interest that we have US to partner in our sovereignty defense. And we are the only Pacific nation that has a sovereignty that is entwined mm. with the Southeast Asian sovereignty. Mm. So my security needs are totally different from the security needs of Fiji, uh, Tuvalu, mm. Kiribati, Samoa. My needs are totally peculiar, totally different. So the construct of my future is in present hands. And cognition of the fact that I need to secure my external borders as well as work my internal security, I've gone to two of my biggest democratic partners within mm. Ruiz mm. without compromising my relations with elsewhere. Mm. They are maintained, but they remain in their own confines and in their own space. Okay, well, let now, me... We've, ask- we've been very transparent on this. All right, well, let They me- all appreciate Excuse me, sorry to interrupt. Well, let me ask you about that, your relations with elsewhere, as you put it. You mentioned the PRC um, in your speech. We know that uh, I think China is uh, PNG's second largest trading partner after Australia. Um, You're interested, both sides are interested in signing an FTA. Can I ask you, in the last few years, we've seen China deepen its connections across the region on the security side, including with Solomon Islands, also with Timor-Leste on the... on towards Southeast Asia. Are there any aspects of those efforts on China's um, part that make you uncomfortable or make other leaders with which you interact uncomfortable? I know you say you keep China in a 
a, a, di a discrete um, part of, of your mental map, if you like, but is there anything that makes you uncomfortable? I, I, I could not say I'm a, I've been uncomfortable with the, with the relations we have with China. They respect us, we respect them. I was given a, a express lane access to both the uh, two of the uh, uh, leaders of China. I had PNG was given a unique placement in Beijing, the Road and Belt Initiative that mm. concluded. Uh, we had a, a, a session with the Premier, and, a, uh, and we also had a session with the President. Mm. Uh, and you had 150 nations in attendance, so for them to give us a, a specific uh, time slot for the two, mm -hmm. number one and number two leadership, I thought was important. But I had in this two meetings, two bilaterals, mm. my ministers and uh, my uh, foreign officials, with, mm. we stick to the economic space, mm. the economic space. Mm. And I've sent this out to our partners in the West. Mm. You have to come in the economic space. If you don't come in the economic space, the greatest threat facing humanity after climate change, greater than climate change, is poverty. Mm. Poverty. Mm. The gap in poverty must be filled. Mm. And the West cannot be ignorant to this. Mm. Economies need to survive. Market needs to be maintained. Mm. And China has given us great respect by keeping our students space. Mm. We've told them before we went to Beijing, don't talk security, mm. don't talk politics, let's talk commerce and trade. Mm. I thought the president, one of the most powerful men on earth, was able to honor PNG by sticking to trade. Mm. They gave commitment to me in the downstream space. They've sent in an investor to look into forestry downstream, agriculture downstream, and fisheries downstream. Mm. They've instructed the only Chinese mining company in PNG, Ramo Nickel, to go nickel downstream in PNG. So they're heeding our instruction on downstream. Mm. And uh, I'm not just here talking about law and order. Mm. I need investors to work with us in the downstream mm. sector space. Mm. If you don't come in, people are coming to pick up that sector in my economy. Mm. It's more powerful mm. than just security. Mm. That's a powerful point, and that's the big criticism of, mm. of uh, the United States strategy in the Pacific and Asia, that it's too security focused. Let me ask you, you mentioned the, the Belt and Road um, Forum in Beijing that you attended in October. Of course, the previous month you attended the second ever summit between um, US and Pacific leaders in Washington. Can I ask you to reflect on, on those two summits? It's quite, it must have been quite interesting to be in Washington and then the following month in Beijing. Can you reflect on the summits, the different vibes, the different experiences? Well, I'll answer you this way, Dr. Michael. The, I had a TED meeting in, Washington, in San Francisco again. And this time the Chinese president was also in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and he had a four-hour bilateral with the U.S. president. Mm. So sometimes we get caught up in the in the politics of two divides, mm. ignoring that politics you cannot divide, but in the economy mm. we must find synergy. Mm. And so uh, they're miles apart. Mm. They're miles apart, and I made reference to poverty earlier on. Uh, poverty will be the biggest driver to public minds, policy mindset. Mm. Poverty alleviation is important. Mm. And the constructive economies, the small Pacific Island states are small in landmass, but they're big ocean nations. Mm. In the ocean are resources. Fish, for instance, f people, investors somewhere in an economy someplace must come and capitalize on the marine resource Pacific Islands have. Mm. produce and sell back to their own economy. There's a huge vacuum uh, in that space. And uh, I just, I'm just i using your, your, your forum here mm. to advocate that uh, we can talk politics, we can talk dogma, we can talk uh, everything else, but if the poverty aspect is not filled in, mm. and not through aid and grant, but through sustainable economic focus, mm. uh, that space will be filled very quickly by people elsewhere. Mm. All right. You mentioned climate change as well, and of course, poverty and economic development and climate change are intertwined with each other. You attended a meeting in the margins of the COP in Dubai <coughs> recently. The summit is still ongoing, and we're getting to the pointy end of that summit. Uh, what would a successful COP look like from PNG's perspective, and what more would you like to see Australia do in relation to climate change? Well, I want to commend Australian leadership. They are cognizant to the, the needs that 
has has been prevalent or is emerging in the Pacific, their own uh, back, uh, their own region, so to speak. So even under uh, uh, Morrison government and now under Albanese government, they they they're focusing on the aspect of supporting the small islands, uh, island countries. I'm happy with this. I'm happy with this. I've been a proponent of. Uh, desalination of water, I've been a proponent of re land reclamation, and I've been a pro proponent of uh, uh, clean energy in the Pacific. So some of these big funds out there, the commitments by big industrialized nations, in the first instance, the mitigation and adaptation, they could assist the small island states who are the biggest uh, and well, most vulnerable right now should be in order. Uh, I've never been uh, a direct COP uh, attendee, simply on a protest note, I feel that uh, too much pledges and uh, no one's really stepping out in honor honoring those uh, commitments. I went to uh, Dubai to appreciate the French uh, leadership. Uh, we've been working that angle. I've been an advocate of uh, the forest resource management. I sort of had a feeling that no one is serious to shut down the coal plants. Coal-fired power plants is not being shut down all over the world. And then the oil and gas business is still running. Energy and, and the fuel for energy is really uh, is constant from these two sources, the hydrocarbon sources. And so knowing that this will be on for some time, my conversation has been, let's preserve the natural ecosystem. The forest, which is a big carbon sink, must be preserved. And, and so that conversation I've been drumming since 2019, uh, 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 my conversation at the United Nations. France has jumped on board under uh, President Macron. He's walked two hours with me in the mountains of uh, uh, Quarry up uh, just a little off from the Kogoda, uh, Kogoda track. Uh, and he's now put his money where his mouth is. His uh, French government is giving $100 million to start with forest conservation in one or two areas. We will map out our entire country and we want, we've committed to preserve 30% of our country in its, uh, to be maintained in its uh, virgin pristine state, but we're looking at if we can find enough sponsors, we want to expand to 50% and beyond. Those current areas that are currently being harvested, we will go into reforestation and, uh, and hopefully work with the agricultural sector in, in, in our tree crops for our grassland. And in the long term, we want to maintain our green identity and companies who operate in PNC will have a label of working in a country that has minimal, if not negative, carbon footprint. So that is the big, big picture conversation, monetizing from our forest conservation. Mm. Those beholders of big carbon footprints, they must commensurate their carbon footprint mm. by preserving forests, simply put. Mm. That, that is what it's all about. All right, let me ask one other question, then I want to give the audience an opportunity. I know there's a lot of rugby league fans in PNG. You mentioned um, league in your speech. Um, give us an update on the bid for a PNG-based uh, rugby league team to play in the NRL. How long will it be before you and I can watch a Rabbitohs play in Port Moresby, PM? It, it might be sooner than later, but uh, we, we can't preempt the process. It must be consistent with the NRL, NRL uh, bid process. And uh, we, we don't take a preeminent uh, place in, in, in the bid that will be opening up. Uh, of course, there's a bid for 18th uh, team. I did sp uh, speak to ABC earlier, asking kindly the, those who want to have a compete for the 18th uh, uh, team that there might be always a 19th place and a 20th place coming up. We have an important date uh, for ourselves coming in our 50th anniversary of independence mm -hmm. in 2025. We want to, uh, if our bid is successfully processed before that, we want an announcement around that time. PNG is the most diverse nation on face of planet Earth. Culturally, we, are, uh, we belong to over 800 different cultures with their own languages. Uh, religious, religion sometimes causes different ways of reading the scriptures, so to speak. Politics causes a huge divide. But something that is common in our country that unites is rugby league. And when the national team is playing, everyone shuts down. Mm -hmm. And so it is similar to the Nelson Mandela strategy of uniting South Africa behind rugby union. For us, it's not just rugby league and sport. It is a national cohesiveness and unity strategy in the face of our 50th anniversary coming on, in the face of life beyond 50. We want a focal point where the nation comes together, 
behind our team. Mm. And so it is really in that order that we, we are proposing our team. Uh, it has been in the, in the, in the proposal for uh, some time, but we will not compromise the independence of the propose, proposal. Uh, it, will, it will get through NRL on its own strength. But of course, government supporting, but we'll allow the uh, proposal to find its own value in the bid uh, that they are putting together. But our team possibly is coming up. Uh, you never know. 2025 announcement, 2027 game time, uh, give us enough lead time to prepare the groundwork. The school boys nurturing, school girls nurturing, putting the, the financial sponsors behind the team so that your tax paying dollar or my tax paying kina don't support, but uh, have our own business case. That's something we're trying to look at, but it's not just rugby league for us, it's a national unity strategy for us. All right. Let me go to the audience. Uh, let me invite you to put your hand up if you'd like to ask a question. I'd ask you to keep it to a short question. Um, who would like to ask a question? I, I'm going to go, first of all, to my colleague Maho Lavale from the Lowy Institute. Maho, if you could just wait till Rachel brings a microphone. Thank you for a, a wonderful speech, um, Prime Minister. I was wondering if you could tell us um, the government's position on Bougainville's push for independence. Well, well, Bougainville uh, is a, uh, thank you, uh, Bougainville is the greatest challenge facing our country right now. We, we uh, are a nation of so much diversity and uh, Bougainville uh, has been on the table for, for as long as, uh, 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 even before independence, there's always been uh, the case of Bougainville on their own. Uh, we've allowed the referendum to go ahead in the United Nations supervised the referendum in 2019. We're now in, the, in uh, uh, the leg of the 2001 peace agreement that allows for parliament to uh, ratify the, uh, the results. We differ a little bit on what they see in terms of uh, what it means by parliament ratifying it. Uh, and on the PNG government side, it means parliament will take a decision uh, in the Bougainville side, they think that Parliament will just affirm the world result. Uh, but it's deeper than this, it's a constitutional matter. The sovereignty is defined by our constitution, and there's a constitutional process uh, in unbundling a sovereignty if it needs to uh, happen in, in, in that manner. So, uh, But we will follow the uh, construct of the 2001 peace agreement. It is explicit, it tells us the path right through. After the referendum is taken place, how national parliament We'll have a handle on, on, on the results and what takes place after. So the process will run its course. I can't preempt the process of national parliament. We're at the doorsteps of the national parliament. Once it comes to the national parliament, then parliament will deal with this issue. And uh, the 2001 peace agreement explicitly says the national parliament decision is final. But we're looking at a win-win situation. Uh, we don't offend the aspirations for uh, fullest autonomy. And uh, they've labeled this as political independence. Uh, I cannot spell this word. I'm prime minister of my country. Uh, it, it's sadistic for me to say one part of my country will be independent. Uh, but there's a peace process. That referendum was born out of a result of a peace process. So part of the peace process, we will run its course all the way into the parliament. Thank you. So someone's hand up here. Yes, in the second row. Thanks very much, Michael. And uh, hi, Prime Minister. Daniel Street from the World Bank's International Finance Corporation. Firstly, thank you for your government's uh, strong collaboration with us, which we value, and thank you for your speech. I just want to ask about your remarks relating to economic diversification and advancing that. You mentioned uh, downstream processing. Um, can you shed light on how you would like to help realise that and, and how you think you'll get there when it comes to propelling economic diversification in the country? All right, we, uh, it, it is a focus uh, in, in right in the horizon for us. And uh, you would have seen Minister Maru working the special economic zone concept. Uh, you would have noticed in our budget, we have money for land accessibility. We have money for state equity to partner those who want to invest in this space. We're also looking for private sector, especially those who have established markets who want to come in and, and settle with us, produce. Uh, Technically, something down the line I'm looking at, all forestry, uh, no more run log export. We process in-country and export the finished products. Agriculture, likewise, 
uh, fisheries likewise. That is in a nutshell, that is what I mean. Hopefully copper uh, downstream at the earliest, uh, uh, gold downstream at the earliest. Uh, the Chinese company MCC is now being instructed by the top to go nickel downstream in PNG. But this cannot happen if my power is not there, my water is not there, my enabling infrastructure is not there. We cognizant of the enabling environment to facilitate an effective downstream processing economy. So at the very earliest, if we can marry these two, create an environment that facilitates downstream processing, we want to get there at the very earliest. And uh, if PNG is developed, simply put on the other side for world bankers and IMFs and, and even Australia and every other nation, if we diversify economy into some of these sectors, then we save our forests from being planted. That forest is a global asset we have. All of us breathe oxygen. I was speaking at Stanford University in 2000, 2010, and I spoke on this concept on forest producing oxygen. The converse on forest absorbing carbon is forest producing oxygen. The greatest commodity on planet Earth for humanity and survival is oxygen and not food. You need the forest to be preserved. We have quite a substantial part of planet Earth's tropical rainforest. So in that context, if we are economically strong elsewhere, then we preserve some of the valuable assets we have, in, especially our biodiversity and our forestry. Um, I'm going to take this lady here on the, on the end, madam. Prime Minister, thank you um, for your speech. Um, you've talked about um, so much about um, all the um, investments and everything, but the law and order in Papua New Guinea is far among the biggest thing that's happening right now. And um, I know Australia is supporting to um, support with the um, police and all that, lawyers and, I mean, the um, judge to help with all that. But with um, law and order, what's, it, what's your uh, prospect in the next two to three years like to combat that? With unemployment, I think um, if there's so many graduates who has no jobs, you know, at the moment, so if there's um, jobs, um, like how are you, how, uh, what's your plan to um, provide employment and that? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, my sister. You would have seen our medium-term development plan four. We envisage to, to, uh, to mobilize over a million Papua New Guineans. Some define jobs from a, a perspective of eight o'clock to four or six job or seven o'clock to five o'clock job. I, def I define job as productive engagements in the in a formal case economy. Whether it's in the SME space or engagement, you uh, citizen, we must mobilize a million people in a productive economic sector. Papua New Guineans have something that most indigenous communities have been isolated. And uh, most people on planet Earth in different countries do not have access to their land rights. You, my sister, and me, and every one of us still have access to our land rights. Land is bankable, land is usable, land is a premium asset. We're not monetizing that. Is Our people still engage in subsistence lifestyle and not in the case economy. Migrating one million people into the case economy at the very earliest will ensure we mitigate quickly unengaged and unengaged uh, uh, young people who are half educated or fully educated. And the job market, as it has been in the last 48 years, has been growing very, very small. That's why we need new industries and my conversation on the downstream processing comes into the play. In the next five to 10 years, we need to expand out the base with new industries. I can build 10 gold mines. In, in fact, I have uh, the six major projects lined up for the next 10 years. But trust me on this one, they will not employ 100,000 every year. They will, to the maximum, employ possibly 30,000. Only 30,000. Our school system is producing over 200,000 attrition every year from grade 8, grade 10, grade 12, and our universities and colleges. And they are part of the number who are restless, unengaged out there, part of the million we're trying to mobilize. So uh, uh, that is, in terms of mobilizing to a fixed job, income earning job, a minimal, but to an economic activity, the opportunity is there to, to engage our people. So. I don't see job creation as just strictly uh, eight to four or six job or seven to five o'clock job. I see 
job creation as giving economic opportunities to all to participate. And so that's something we want to do at the very earliest. You are very much correct that law and order remains our number one risk. And as I said in my speech, my government under my watch have invested substantially to the law and justice sector, including putting up uh, independent commission against corruption. But in our current budget allocation trend, if we want to mitigate law and order, it will, in, it will take us up to 15 years of consistent inter allocation resource at this envelope. Uh, our partners with Australia allow, allows us to bridge the time and make that intervention in five years. So hopefully in five years, you have a better place. I might give the last audience question to Meg Keane from the Lowy Institute. Meg? We've talked a lot about internal... Meg Keane. We've talked a lot about internal security in the United States and Australia, but you haven't said much about PNG's position in the region and as a senior member of the Pacific Island countries and your vision on how PNG will play that leadership role going forward as it too matures. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. If you had uh, Prime Minister Albanese in Parliament when we addressed the press uh, on uh, Thursday, uh, he used a line, and I'd like to uh, rephrase that line. He said, we are sad regional leaders. I think we have emerged to a stage where we set a podium in as far as uh, regional relations are concerned. And that's the way we are cultivating PNG to, be, to ensure that we remain a robust buff of democracy in the in the midst in the face of uh, uh, and I was concluding my speech in the face of an Asian century. I believe in my heart of hearts. Don't ask me why, but the next hundred years uh, will be an Asian hundred years. That's where the combustion of our global economy will take place. The consumer appetite is big in Asia. The need for all economies in Asia to be sustained at a level is so huge, and so I believe they will still be a very big place and. Uh, uh, the Australasia, Pacific, PNG, New Zealand cannot be standing watching. Uh, if we are standing watching, we will be trampled upon. Uh, we need to participate. We relate without compromising who we are. And PNG stands as buffer to the greater Asia and a link into Pacific. You've experienced that in 1945 when there was an intrusion into our part of the world. PNG was the buffer. Uh, today we may not, and God forbid, we don't like to be a fiscal buffer, but in the world of cyber, commerce, trade, ideology, PNG will forever remain as a buffer, keeping Pacific as a free, Pacific as a free economy, Pacific as a clean environment, Pacific as a nice place. And trust me, I travel the world. I will never compromise living in Pacific for other parts of the world. I think we live in a beautiful part of planet Earth. Mm. So that's our said responsibly. We want to keep Pacific safe. PM, I'm going to ask you the last question, and it's on a similar theme. It's, it's to go back to the bilateral relationship between Australia and PNG. As you mentioned a couple of times, in 2025, Papua New Guinea celebrates its 50th, um, the 50th anniversary of its independence from Australia, which is a tremendous milestone. Gough Whitlam once said, if history were to obliterate the whole of my public career, save my contribution to the independence of a democratic Papua New Guinea, I should rest content, which was a beautiful thing to say, I think. What, what do you think that Australian and Papua New Guinean prime ministers should be working together on in the next 50 years? What should you, you and your successors and Mr Albanese and his successors be working on in the next 50 years in this bilateral relationship? Well, Dr Michael, if you heard my speech, I started off by giving you a context of PNG as a small economy, a very small, feeble economy in 1975. Politically speaking, we may have achieved uh, political independence, but economically we are still dependent much on the outside world, including Australia. So the construct of an independent economy uh, is something that is very much a, a, a big part of my focus since 2019. Uh, Take Back PNG is all about a better economy, uh, being in the jump seat in, far, in, 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 in as far as our economy is concerned. So the next 50 years is all about growing our economy together. If PNG is a big economy, Australia has another place to invest. Australian firms have another place to invest. Why going afar off to invest when you traditionally have been investing in us? With a strong economy, you can choose to remain and invest in us. So uh, if you ask me what is the next 50 years, 
I want the next 50 years to be a stronger economy, uh, PNG to be a vibrant economy, and we totally strong economically to contribute not just uh, to PNG itself, but to our Pacific brothers and sisters, to Australia, and uh, preserve our democracy in the process. So that's the construct of the next 50 years. Gulf Whitlam gave us political independence. He meant well, but he left behind a Highlands Highway that was not fully constructed. You could not have traveled to Medang by road that time. Uh, Hirutano Highway and Maggie Highway, and that, that was almost it. And uh, our big land mass was worked upon in the last 48 years. Uh, we still uh, re reconstruct the economy and our Australia and PNG as we are working to, together today. If we shape up and strengthen my economy, that is the greatest contribution we could have done for PNG. And uh, look, having said this, I got no complaint for Australians. They remain our greatest support up to this point in time. In the 50s and 60s, if not in the 40s, Australia itself were an emerging nation. Uh, you were given the island of Papua New Guinea to look after by the British government. And so we have no complaint, we have no obligations to you, you have no obligations to us, but as a nation that birthed Papua New Guinea, Australian taxpayers and government continuously over many, many years have to stood with us. And look, we are stuck here forever. There's six, there's six plate tectonics that, that contributes to what PNG is today. I can name all of them, but the biggest is the Australasian plate. The Australasian plate is the one that you are part of, your continent, that runs half of my country. The Papua and the Southern Fold Belt is part of the Australasian plate. So right down to the core, we are joined together at the hips. And we are here forever. So we are here forever. You taught us rugby league. You brought us missionaries. You saved our free, free economy. You gave us democracy. The sovereignty we have today is a construct of Australian government. The borders we have today is not in the doing of popular leaders. Our eastern borders, our northern borders, our western divide between present-day PNG and present-day Indonesia is a construct of Australian government. And so in that sad history, we have a responsibility to construct a sad future. That is our business today. Well, very well said, PM. You're right. We're stuck here. Uh, we're stuck here together, but it's a nice place to be stuck. <laughs> um, we're joined to the hip, as you said. There's a lot of um, beautiful connections between our country, um, including but not limited to rugby league. And um, the Institute is very proud to have hosted you twice. Of course, I've heard you speak in Port Moresby as well. I heard, I heard the PM give a really inspirational speech at uh, the University of Papua New Guinea earlier this year on a glass half full and a glass half empty. Thank you for returning for a second time. We look forward to hosting you again in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to say at the end of this year how proud I am that the PM is actually the third Pacific leader who's spoken to the Institute after Samoa's Fiame Naomi Mata'afa and also Fiji's Sitaveni Rambuka. Um, so the Pacific remains at the centre of, inst of the Institute's work and at the top of our agenda. PM, you've done us a great honour by speaking to us again. Thank you for giving us your vision um, for the country and the bilateral relationship and for taking my questions. Please thank the PM. Thanks, PM.